It's time for the Horror Guys. Yay! Yay! I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. And it's episode 301 of our magnificent podcast where we talk about horror movies. Horror Weekly from HorrorWeekly.com. You betcha. A quick reminder, we have launched our companion podcast slash newsletter, Classics Weekly, a brand new show devoted to classic films. Our first episode, Casablanca, launched earlier last this week. And it was cool seeing that. I'd never seen it before. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, It it, it, it is. It's it's a classic for a reason. I'd seen it before, and, you know, it was a movie. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Okay. I just watched it a little more critically this time, and it is really good, well made. It holds up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's a similar newsletter and podcast to this one, so if you like this and like old movies, you should check it out. We're going to focus more on just one movie a week there. We go in a lot more in depth with the trivia and the commentary. Uh-huh. We've already done our, got our Singing in the Rain episode ready to go out as number two next week with many more to follow. You betcha. And again, that one can be found at classicsweekly.com. Okay. In addition, the latest issue of Horror Monthly print magazine is now on sale. Go to horrormonthly.com. And you can find links to pick that up as either a print or an ebook. This month has all the usual, all the usual reviews, thirty-seven of them, as well as a retrospective on the five original Planet of the Apes films, which we think still hold up pretty well. Uh huh. Plus, there's a short story. A short story. We write fiction. We do. We do. Bonus. Whether it's any good or not, we'll leave it to you guys to tell us. <laughs> it's a bonus. Yeah. And, but this week, right here, right now, we've got five movies and some short films. What do we got? Well, we're going to start out with the very funny horror comedy, Evil Sublet. And then we're going to go one that has really no humor at all. It's very serious. The Weight. It's an international one, a Spanish film. Yes. And the three uh, that follow are kind of a mixed bag as far as emotions. There's the very depressing, The Devil's Bath, the very mental, Booger. We're going to see how many times we can say Booger. And the ridiculous Population Purge. And three short films. And three short films. Woohoo! Yeah. All right. And again, if you want to read these reviews as they come out, Go over to horrorweekly.com and subscribe to the newsletter. And you get the print version of all these, spoilers included. Yeah, we only give you a taste here on the new stuff, so we don't spoil them too badly. These are all new movies, so we're not going to spoil them here. But if you want to get spoiled, you can read the full spoilery synopses over on the site. And we can give you an idea here whether you should check them out or not. We'll give you a taste here, yeah. Yeah. We're not going to spoil them. Yeah. Start out with Evil Sublet okay. from 2024. Written and directed by Alan Piper. Stars Jennifer Lee Houston, Charlie Tucker, Sally Struthers, Katie Sullivan, and Helen Hong. Sally Struthers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's well, still around? I haven't seen her do She's anything since working. South Park. I don't know if that was really her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm going to jump out on the limb here and say this is my favorite of the week. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I agree there. Hour and 45 minutes, trailer in the show notes. Of course, this one just came out, so you probably haven't seen it, but we definitely recommend it. Yeah, it's just officially released this month. Spoiler free, what happens? Well, the cast, script, direction, settings, and props all made for a really good movie. It's heavy on the humor, plenty of horror elements too, but lots of humor. And tropes are used very effectively. It's got a lot of clever bits in it. Stuff you've seen a thousand times before Mm -hmm. that gets, you know, spun around here. We liked it a lot, and and more than we expected. Yeah, you watch the trailer, it looks kind of... almost reluctant with the trailer. Low-budget chintzy, but... It but, was actually very good. Yeah, it was. And the, that apartment is cool, the decor. <laughs> you keep saying that. You I would do. love those decorations. I, I would love that apartment, yeah. And they also uh, were able to film in a um, haunted ride-through attraction at Coney Island, a yeah. real one. Uh-huh. Yeah. Got some footage there. All right. A brief taste of this one, then. A man plays a prank on his wife that goes very, very badly as credits roll. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. very badly. More pranks need to go like that. Maybe we get fewer pranks. Oh. <laughs> All right, we got a couple people walking down the street, talk, and they see a sign about an evil apartment building for rent. And he asks, what does that mean? And she explains evil means East Village. You know, like Soho, only different. Mm-hmm. Well, Alex and Ben argue about how the evil apartment is too cheap. Parker, the realtor, takes them inside, describing it all the way up this long steps. It's like on the 
well, third floor, but it's, it's a second floor apartment or something. It's very confusing that yes. way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. I forget which way it it's is. It's French. Yeah, yeah. We're on the we're on the we're, <laughs> you, they, apartment they, number two is on the third floor. Yeah, ground floor, and then first floor is the second floor, and yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, she mentioned some drawbacks to the place, including the former owner killing his entire family. Well, a lot of the previous owners came to horrific ends, she says. But it's got a high ceiling and a garden and a, and a sit-in kitchen. Well, how, many, how many apartments in New York are going to have a sit-in kitchen? For that price, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, then we cut to a woman who bought a ventriloquist dummy at a thrift store, and it ended up killing all her roommates. Or maybe she just dreamed that. Ned and Lauren are psychics at the carnival, and Lauren does a reading on the doll. Turns out she used it as a sex toy. Oh my! Oh, she's weird. Yeah. Well, they're kind of weird too. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, very and, much. And they're funny. They're they're a colorful couple. Well, Alex and Ben move into the new apartment. Oliver, Hetty, and Ben's sister help with the move. Alex figures out that turning on the lights actually makes the place darker. And this is a very funny joke that they come back to several times during the movie. Yeah. She turns on the light and it gets dimmer. She turns on another light and it gets even dimmer. She keeps adding more and more lamps to the... <laughs> and it just keeps getting darker. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was really funny. Uh-huh. Uh, the more lamps she plugs in, the darker it gets. Late that night, doors open and close. And uh, Sis li- listens to a weird man outside yelling at the sky. I don't think that's haunted. I think that's New York. <laughs> yeah, that's just normal. Yeah. <laughs> when she sees a New York cockroach, she decides to go to a motel instead. On the second day, though, more things act strangely in the house. Alex, Ben, and Sis go to the carnival, and they go on a haunted house ride, and Alex gets stuck inside. Ned and Lauren walk up, and Lauren grabs Alex's head. They need our help, Lauren laments. Yeah, he's having a vision of terrible things to come. That night, Alex experiences some weirdness with the doors. All right, we should probably stop there. It's a haunted house movie, yeah, but it's it a is. very funny one. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it's full of horror movie cliches, but it works with them and rolls with the inherent silliness. There's, yeah, you know, like the darkness. I mean, turn on the lights and it gets darker. That's dumb, but it's also very but funny. It's really effective. <laughs> yeah, and the cast is really good. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't recognize... I think the husband, Ben, I sort of recognized from something, but most some, of them were the not faces, big names. Some of the faces were recognizable. Oh, Sally but, Struthers, of well, course. of course, yeah. She worked 70 years ago in something, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> She's still working. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, the orange-faced man in the top hat is actually pretty cool looking for a villain. I mean, he, I don't know if he's the villain, but he, he shows he's up a few times. a villain, yeah. And Sally Struthers is now a horror movie bad guy. She's up there with Jason and Freddy. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> well, the trailer, again, if you watch the trailer, it's not very impressive. But the film itself was far better than we expected. We yep. thought it was very funny. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. again, I think both of us, it's our favorite of the week. Yeah, would highly recommend. The other one is also very good. The Weight from 2024. Written by F. Javier Gutierrez. Stars Victor Clavijo. Ruth Diaz, and Moises Ruiz. If you couldn't tell from those names... It's Spanish. It's subtitled In from Spanish. Spain. Uh-huh. Yes. Spanish, not Spanish. Spain, Spanish, Spanish yes. yes. Not Mexican, Spanish. Yeah. Uh-huh. One hour and 42 minutes. A trailer in the usual place. Spoiler free. It's dry, hot, and sweaty movie set in an arid part of Spain. My goodness, these people sweat a lot. Yeah, uh-huh. It looks very deserty and very yeah, hot. Yeah, very unpleasant just being there, even without the bad stuff. Yeah, you can almost feel it. <laughs> yeah. Things start out okay for the hero and make a decline to terrible, but we wonder if it's entirely his choice or outside factors. He makes a decision and regrets it over and over. Yeah, things just get worse and worse. It's a slow burn that progresses steadily enough to be engrossing with a good wrap-up. Mm-hmm. I liked that. And we, yeah, we said the other one was uh, our favorite because it was just kind of out of the blue surprisingly funny. This, If you're just into standard horror, this is probably a much better movie for straight horror, mm-hmm. not comedy. Yeah, there's, there's, I don't think there's any humor in this one. Not really. <laughs> I don't think there's a single joke. <laughs> yeah. Okay, give us a taste. Well, Don Francisco talks to Eladio about raising his family in the mountains. Francisco says he'll follow Eladio and his family to live on the estate out in the country. And credits roll. Well, three years later, 
Aladio teaches his son how to shoot a gun on the estate. Now, this is important. Actually, three years pass, and they're all mm-hmm. very happy, and nothing has gone wrong, and everybody does what they're supposed to do. It's all good. Yeah, they're all settled in this, and it's decent. I mean, it, it looks like life is hard, but it looks like a pleasant family life, and, you know, everybody getting along. And Aladio got what he wanted. A little little yeah. village, and yeah. Well, Aladio manages. Um, Aladio's wife, Marcia, doesn't like her son, Florin, learning how to shoot. But she has to go along with it. They live on a hunting reservation. That's what yeah, they do. It's they, kinda, they, they, they take hunters out for, for deer and stuff. This is the lifestyle, so he's got to get used to it, yeah. Well, very soon after, Florin brings home a big buck. He's good at it. Yeah, he's a good hunter. Well, Aladio goes to town, and Don Carlos says he sold 13 stands for hunting. But Eladio says that's not safe. Bullets will be flying everywhere. There needs to be no more than 10 because of the amount of space. There's too much overlap. Well, he says Don Francisco, the big boss, would never approve of that. But there is money involved, and Eladio does need more. Fit in three more. I get some money. Here's an envelope. Yeah, I'll even give you so much money you could afford a television of your own. Okay. Well, the family is very poor. And we have a scene where they argue about missing shirts and missing clothes, missing overalls. Which makes no sense whatsoever until yeah. later. Yeah, I mean, she's they're doing their laundry, and, you know, where'd these clothes go? Well, Marcia hears, that Don, uh, hears about what Don Carlos wants, and she wants the money. She urges Eladio to do the Ill- illegal hunting operation. Eladio said no, he wasn't going to do it. Mm-hmm. So then the bad guy, what's, uh, Don Carlos, comes and talks to the wife, uh-huh. who's greedy and she wants the money. So yeah. she puts the pressure on. Yeah, she calls him a coward even. Yeah. And so he caves. Well, the hunters arrive, and there's a lot of them. They're, they are packed in. Eladio has allowed more than he was supposed to. But Don Carlos does pay him the promised bribe. Flores goes to see... Uh, with them and counts how many bucks that got shot. Except the first thing that gets shot that day is Flores, the son. Ooh, they were right about there being too much overlap. Well, back at home, Marcia counts her money. Both she and Eladia wonder why the truck is driving back to them in such a hurry. They've bought, they brought Florin's body home. And Eladio knows that this is all his fault. Okay, so their son is dead. It's all his fault. Yeah. Guilt. uh Guilt and more guilt. Guilt. Let's pile on the guilt. Oh, piles and piles of it. And then we start getting some supernatural guilt. (laughs) He starts drinking and, yeah, he had formerly given up drinking. Yeah, okay. She she thinks that God is punishing them. Yeah, uh, we will stop there. Things go downhill from there. Yeah. Yeah. And as we said before, we one thing we learned from this movie is that Spain is a sweaty place where it never rains. <laughs> I'm sure there's some nice, cool, temperate parts, but yeah, this was a very sweaty part of it. <laughs> it's a slow tale of a man who makes one bad decision and pays for it over and over again. There's a scene where he transforms into a wild boar. But it is just a dream. Don't go into this thinking it's a werewolf movie. Cool effect, though. It's in the trailer, and we were expecting like something like that to happen, but it's just a dream. It's well acted, and the sets are great, but it is very slow moving with no explanations until the very end. Mm-hmm. A lot of this makes no sense while you're watching it, but it gets there eventually. It does make sense at the end. There are hints throughout that Eladio may be cursed somehow, but it's never really spelled out until the end, and even then we don't get a lot of details. Enough. It, I, I wonder if it I, might tie in with some kind of some bit of Spanish mythology that we're not familiar with. No, that's possible. Yeah. I mean, the missing mm-hmm. clothes tie in, and mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just bones, don't know. Some issues with bones and things. And, yeah. The magic here doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it, it's clear enough. You know, you can see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Still, it was a really good exploration of madness brought on by guilt over this bad decision and how it all spirals out of control. It was good. But it was kind of slow. Yeah, slow and steady, though. Builds, and th- builds one thing on top of another. And I think we both yeah. needed a shower afterwards. It was just so sweaty. <laughs> you, you felt dust. You felt dusty <laughs> And gritty afterwards. and dirty. It's out in the middle of the sandy old desert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, like I said, we needed a shower. But instead, we got the devil's bath. The devil's bath. <laughs> which sounds, you know, it's a, what? It's sounds a, clean. It's a, it's a nice euphemism for a nice, you know, freshwater stream or a, a spring out in the forest. No. No? After the movie was over, we looked it up. It's a euphemism for depression. Yes. It's an, it's an old way of saying, you know, you're steeping in the devil's bath, you're depressed. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, this movie, Devil's Bath 2024, written and directed by Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz, stars Anja Plocht. Oh, boy. Yeah, that name. Maria Hofstadter and David Scheid, two hours and one minute. So it's a little on the long side, but I didn't yeah. think it felt that way. And this one was subtitled too, wasn't it? Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. So many subtitles. It's, it's, are we watching or are we reading? <laughs> yeah. And and again, this was, uh, you know, not my favorite of the week, but really good. I liked it. De- de- depressing. It's not a happy movie. Oh, my goodness, not a happy movie. It's well done, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well done. Yeah. All right, well, uh, spoiler free. Well, the devil's bath, like we said, it's an old term for depression, and this movie has it in abundance. Oh, yeah, it does. Life was hard in the old days, made harder by mental illness. It's really beautifully filmed and on the long side and seriously grim, but it was more fascinating than entertainment. Um, yeah, we, we don't regret seeing it. We liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, a little bit more detail here in the beginning part of it is... We start out in Austria in the 18th century. And this is the part of Austria that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is from. Exactly the same place, I saw it in the trivia, yeah. Uh, He was a bit more recent, though. Yes, he was, yeah. (laughs) A baby cries, and his brother, Christoph, picks him up to calm him down. Christoph's father calls, so he puts down the baby and leaves it alone. A tired-looking woman comes in and takes the baby into the woods. She walks up into the mountain and throws the baby off the giant waterfall. What? She then runs to the castle where she says, I've committed a crime. Later, we see a man cutting off her fingers and we see her severed head in a cage. Credits roll. And we, at this point, are saying, what the heck? Why did he, why did she do that? Why did they do that to her? This is kind of explained at the end. It is. Yeah. Well, then we cut to a younger looking woman weaving a crown of ivy and packing a few things. Then she, her brother, and her mother wheel a cart with a chicken through the woods. She's Agnes, and the crowd carries her around for her wedding. She's getting married to a man named Wolf. Afterwards, they play whack a chicken in the field, like a pinata with a live chicken. Yeah, it, we got to laugh out of that. Wedding games, yeah. <laughs> wedding entertainment. Yeah, blindfold yeah. them, give them a stick, and the, beat the chicken to death. The reception party, yeah. <laughs> he puts a blindfold on her and leads her through the woods where he's bought a house. She wasn't expecting that. He spent all his money on the land and took a mortgage as well. She hates it. But she doesn't argue with him. Well, I don't know about hating it, but she's really hesitant on it. And, yeah. it, and it is out isolated away from everything. And it's kind of a cave of a Well, house. she was expecting to live with the mother in this house mm-hmm. that's been furnished and clean and, you know, has everything. And this is just a big stone thing with a dirt floor and it's empty and dark. And it's, yeah, very, very cave-like. It's built yeah. into the kind of the side of a hill. And, yeah. Not a homey home. Yeah, not yet. No. Well, they have a big party, a wedding reception kind of thing, but they're all Wolf's friends, and she doesn't know anyone. Her brother is there, and he has a wedding gift. He gives her a finger from that woman from earlier. That's quite a wedding gift. Oh, yeah, he gave her the (laughs) finger. Yeah. Uh, Basically, it's some kind of fertility charm, which she puts under the bed so she gets pregnant sooner. She then prays to be a good wife and mother. That night, she wants sex on her wedding night. But he's got other ideas, which she finds disappointing. Let's just say they're not going to have babies that way. Not the way he wants to do it. Yeah. And this is a very devout community. They're they're very religious. Yes. Yeah. Very conservative. They're all they're all Christians, I guess. It's but, a f- but her it's is a a sort of a different on... flavor. She's got a lot of this nat- naturalist pagan stuff mixed in. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they all do somewhat, but her more than. The rest of them. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a flavor of Christianity for sure. Yeah. In the morning, Wolf is gone. She, look, she looks for him out in the, in the forest and sees a poster of that child-murdering woman stuck to a tree. Then she finds the dead woman and her head set up in like a shrine or maybe it's a warning or something out in the woods. She takes a close look, but it doesn't upset her. Then she runs into Wolf's mother, who puts her to work right away. And it's like, you there, come here, get to work. Yeah, and basically uh, fishing. You know, fishing. I guess that's pond. fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very mucky. but It's yeah. very labor-intensive. Labor-intensive, mucky work. Yeah. And we see that Agnes doesn't really fit in with Wolf's family. Her mother-in-law has lots of helpful advice. But it's also more than a little intrusive. And she's there every single day. Yes. Yeah. That evening, she once again puts the finger under the mattress, and once again, she tries to have sex with her husband, 
who just rolls over and goes to sleep. Yeah, it ain't going to happen. Well, Agnes goes out with the mother-in-law, Ganglion, to do the, do the laundry. She makes a friend there who shows her some interesting places out in the woods. And it, it, I thought it was kind of funny, too. It, the laundry place is just a place by a, a running stream with lots of rocks where they pound the laundry on it and beat the laundry. And, and uh, Agnes is there, you know, doing laundry. And, You're in and my she space. looks up, oh, I'm sorry, am I in your space? Like, you know, <laughs> like they got the best rocks staked out, you know, the flattest ones and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's, but it's a kind of a friendly communal area where they're, all the women are doing laundry in yeah. the same area there. So she makes friends and goes out and explores the woods. And then she comes home late, and the old lady has already made dinner for Wolf. None for her, though. You'll be here at dinner time or do without. Mm -hmm. Plus, they burned all of Agnes's little nature trinkets in the fire, all her little pagan things. Agnes complains that Ganglion doesn't like her and comes around too often. And Wolf just kind of brushes it off. Yeah. While fishing the next day, Agnes finds a big cow skull, which is supposed to be bad luck. We should stop there. Yeah, I think we should probably stop there. More stuff happens. Yeah. Okay, so she's isolated, she's depressed, and she's not too happy with her new husband or her house or anything else. And her state of mind gets steadily worse as it progresses. And she finds a unique way to get out of this unhappy marriage. She does. She does. Yeah. Again, the devil's bath is an old term for depression, and it turns out Agnes is an outsider. It's walking distance, but different villages, and no one will talk to her or explain anything, and then they treat her like an idiot because she doesn't catch on right away. Everyone acts surprised when she gets depressed. <laughs> they don't out, Nobody outright abuses her, but they don't make her at home either. Yeah, just neglect. Yeah, solitude. Yeah, despite being around others, she's, still, she's lonely and... Yeah. We get some hints early on that Wolf might be gay. He, he's, him and his friend they are closer like, than they should they be. They seem like good friends, yeah. Yeah. And the way he... He sure doesn't like having sex. Yeah, they they don't consummate. Yeah. Yeah. He seems nice enough and concerned for Agnes's well-being, but she's otherwise completely, he's otherwise completely clueless. Mm -hmm. And their mother-in-law in the beginning, she seems like a jerk. It turns out most of her advice really is kind of helpful, and she is trying to help. She's just annoying about it. Yeah, kind yeah. of intrusive. But, yeah. but it all turns off Agnes, and she gets more and more depressed. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting drama about old-time mental illness, but I thought it was a bit too long. No, I didn't think it was far too long. Yeah, I, I thought it was okay. It one, there's one scene where um, she's sent to a hospital, and it's like Leeches. the latest high-tech medical technology <laughs> you want to call it that yeah that's something yeah there's leeches and and actually they run a thread through the back of her neck oh yeah that's great and, and she's prescribed to run it back and forth they leave it in there like through the hole and to <laughs> weave it back and forth so it festers yeah and the poison will draw out her her mental illness and this will make her better yeah, can't nobody does that anymore. Can't argue the science. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. can't argue. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful film, but sad, sad movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, the next one is 2024's Booger. Booger. I think they just made this movie to see how many times they could say booger in a movie. How many times can they say booger? How many times can we say booger in this podcast? I think we're up to about a dozen already. <laughs> yes. Written and directed by Mary Douterman, stars Grace Glowicki, Garrett Bernard, and Heather Matarazzo. Hour and 18 minutes, trailer in the usual place. Um, I think this one was Shudder. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Spoiler free, uh -huh. shall I tell them? Well, here we have grief and depression jumbled up with some very strange happenings, which makes us wonder, uh, is the main character, you know, what's happening to her, how much is real, and how much is in her head? It is all eventually explained, and it's a pretty entertaining trip getting there. We give it a thumbs up. We open on phone videos of Izzy playing with Booger the cat. Ah, oh, that's why it's called Booger. That's the cat's name. Yeah. Well, their cat just showed up one day, and we cut to some time later, and everyone is out is calling about attending Izzy's memorial service. She's died, and Anna is now past due on her bills since her roommate isn't paying anymore. Yeah, so she's roll. got everything, and she's not splitting the bills anymore. Depressed. Anna lays on the bed and listens to the rats in the attic. She finds Izzy's phone and watches videos from Izzy's point of view. 
Later, Booger the cat bites her and runs out the window. She walks all around the block calling, Booger! Booger! About a thousand times. <laughs> she talks to Izzy's mother, Joyce, who puts a band-aid on the bite wound. Anna's boyfriend, Max, comes over, and she mostly ignores him. The wound on her hand continues to hurt, and she's also still worried about Booger, who still hasn't come home, and she goes out looking for him at night. She's suddenly terrified of a dog, and the sound of the halogen lights annoys her. Huh. And her, yeah, think her senses are getting more sensitive. Huh. She, uh, she goes home and absentmindedly starts chewing on her own hair. Huh. Like a cat licking. Like a weird cat. Anna starts putting up posters for Booger all around town, and the woman at the pet store is annoying. Anna is too distracted by the caged bird in the store to notice how annoying she is, though. Chirp, 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 chirp. And, yeah. In <laughs> so the morning... She's very interested in that bird. <laughs> yeah. In the morning, she wakes up under the coffee table. At work, her boss, Devin, wants her to come back to work. She's just not interested in that anymore. Later, she goes out with Max and pukes up a hairball in the restroom. Is she becoming a cat? That's what we're starting to wonder here. And that's where we're going to stop, because any more spoilers. Yeah. All right, this movie has so much puking. The filmmakers obviously <laughs> own a real cat. Yep. <laughs> I suspect they also challenge themselves to have the film that says the word booger the most times in history. Oh, boy. Somebody needs to count. <laughs> it's more of a psychological story of weird grief coping mechanisms than straight horror. It's entertaining, it's low key. It's on the edge of horror, though. It's, it's low key horror. If you're looking for a tame horror movie, this would be a good one. It is, yeah. And, uh, you know, characters that you care about. And, yeah, I, I liked it. Um, you know, it makes it, and it kind of misled us a little bit. There were some red herrings. Izzy died, and there's very mysterious weird why and how and all that. It mm -hmm. gets explained later on, and it's not anything that, yeah. Yeah, but it's an extreme case of dealing with grief and depression, and I, I thought it was really good. And I yeah. and I really liked how it resolved. I really liked the ending. That was that was nice. Well, considering the, the, the purpose, the meaning and everything behind it, what happened and why she was doing this, mm -hmm. it makes good sense, and it was a good ending, yes. Yeah, yeah. Didn't leave us hanging. Yeah. Well, the next one... Um, Wow. Population Purge 2024. Which has nothing to do with the other Purge movies. Nothing whatsoever. No. You, did you realize that going into this? I was thinking that was connected. Okay, no, it's not. It's not. Directed by Brian Johnson, written by him and Toby Osborne, stars S. Lamar Wilson, Peter Holland, and Lindsay Soto, hour and 24 minutes. So it's a short one. Mm hmm. Well, despite the title, it doesn't have anything to do with a Purge series of movies. There was and is a plague, and bad people did and are doing bad things. It's post-apocalyptic, with most of the population of the world is dead, and the rest are struggling to survive. Well, unfortunately, we can't say that it was good in any way. We both pretty much hated this one. The story is disjointed and doesn't make any logical sense. The acting is hit and miss, mostly miss, and the editing is very strange. We wouldn't recommend it. Wow, that that's glowing, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, stay tuned, though, because we've got short films coming up. Give us a taste. What is this stinker happening? Well, we get a voiceover about the deadly outbreak of a new disease. It was a government program to manage the population. Everyone was poisoned by the government, and only the rarest blood types, AB, AB positive, positive, were allowed to survive. Regular people can only survive with regular blood transfusions of AB positive. Okay, now let me get this straight. Everybody who doesn't have AB positive is going to die, unless they get regular transfusions from somebody who does. Right, that counteracts this p disease that's going around. You figure all the president and the, pie and the all the government people and all that, they all have AB plus? Or? And, and what was their point of doing this? I, yeah, I don't, yeah. Real estate? <laughs> Well, Onslow, the district warden, is in charge of executing some criminals. Oh, and they got to kill more. Yeah, for some reason. And he seems to enjoy his work. 
Elsewhere, Maya is a scavenger going through closed shops for stuff to take. You know, if 98% of the population was dead, shops would kind of be free at this point. It would destroy the economy for sure. Everybody would have everything they wanted. There'd be a lot of stuff left. Well, we cut to to people in the wilderness shooting at, at each other and fighting. Maya and her grandfather, Charlie, live alone in a compound. She helps him donate blood to others. He's got the rare type. He demands to take blood into town himself. The woods are full of scalpers just waiting to get their hands on us. So this decrepit old man decides to walk to town alone by himself because he knows the scalpers are waiting to get him. What could go wrong? Charlie goes to Jade's, who buys his blood for the black market. Onslow brings his son to Naomi, who is the camp doctor. The son is sick and the disease is spreading. What he needs is clean AB positive blood, so he needs more than his ration. She starts telling uh, telling that um, he can buy some black market blood, but he yells that he's against that's against the law, and he is kind of he's the, the boss. He's the he's the he is the, the law, leader. So, yeah. yeah, he wants to find a source of the blood, an unregistered AB plus survivor, and Naomi tells him about Jade. And then we cut to a montage of Maya killing grungy people in masks. A strange blonde woman saves Maya from the baddies. Onslow talks to his wife's grave, and he regrets the whole situation. So maybe he's not a complete lunatic. We cut to a group of scalpers who complain that their donors are drying up and dying. There would be a limited population. Especially when they're all out in the woods shooting each other. And they keep shooting and fighting and killing each other and getting executed. Oslo's men beat up Jade and find out about Charlie. Oslo uh, goes to the scalper next for more information about the source. Let's stop there. Yeah, because other stuff happens. Yeah, stuff does happen. All right, so there's a spoiler I can't talk about. No, Um, no, we don't know. No. (laughs) <laughs> Nothing to do with this purge, but I expect whatever ma- audience it manages to get will not realize that until it's too late. A lot of scenes here just make no sense and have no context. There's Charlie and the Abraham Lincoln thing. What the hell does that got to do with anything? And there's a bunch of was, people in his audience that... And he was like having a sideshow kind of circusy kind of thing going. Yeah, that... No one would have gone to. Yeah, just for his own benefit, I guess. There's a man with poison gas. What oh, was up with that? I don't know. And Maya, Maya was in her combat montage when she says she never leaves camp. Huh. How do you do that? Yeah. A lot of the actors wear masks of some sort, but it's never explained why. Because extras? Maybe. Budget? Limited I don't know. Limited number of extras? Yeah. And a chunk of this was obviously filmed in a haunted house attraction. And so, I had a problem with that, because that... Is, it was probably a very good haunted house attraction when it's dark and foggy and, you know, nighttime creepy lighting. This was like a Tuesday in, afternoon. In the bright light of day, it looked like a haunted house attraction made, yeah. of, made of rebar and, you know, yeah. The acting is a mixed bag. Charlie was interesting. Onslow was alternating between lunatic and tragic. Maya was just plain miscast, not looking at all like some kind of a post-apocalyptic warrior. And it's an interesting idea that's completely implausible. It's mostly poorly acted, and a lot of it doesn't make any sense, even considering that the whole plot is ridiculous. I declare it a stinker. Oh, harsh. But I... I see your next line here. You and I are in full agreement. So. I, this is one of those where I can't fully disagree with you, which I hate to say that about projects where people put in time, effort, and money into, but I just wasn't entertained. And I don't think it was very good. I think a lot of it was the casting and the editing. Yeah, the acting isn't strong and the story is weak. And yeah, yeah, can't yeah. can't give this one a thumbs up. Short films, yay! Yay! The Changing Room from 2022, directed by Sam Ev- Evenson, written by him and Jeff Special, stars Jamie Taylor Ballesta and Alan Maxson. Four minutes, 25 seconds. Link to watch it on YouTube. A woman finds a dress in a boutique and wants to try it on. The changing room is, hey, it's right there, but he's got a do not enter sign on it. This area closed. It's a changing room. What could go wrong? Yeah, she goes upstairs and goes anyway. The inside of the changing room is mirrored on opposite walls, giving that infinity effect that everyone loves to play in front of. This time, however, she might not be alone. 
And I have to say that I was impressed with the cinematography or however they did that. Computer, the mirror effects. Computer cheating, you know, however. Because it's a very small room that she's in. It's a changing room. It's, it's a good size changing room. And wall, you know, one wall is But having room for her and the cameraman, uh, and it, it was very and tight. You see the infinity effect. And then there's things happening in the distance in the infinity reflections. Yeah, it's very well done special yeah. effects. Yeah, it was neat. No dialogue here and only one character, sort of. Changing rooms are inherently creepy. You ever go in a changing room in one of those little places? They yeah. Can, they can be. Yeah. Especially in modern times with easily hidden cameras. At one point she sees something on the roof and she's like, that's a camera, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's worse. <laughs> well, it's very clearly and cleverly shot, especially the mirror effects. And it's always very obvious what's happening. Never quite find out why, but that's part of the mystery. That's part of its charm. Yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I like that one. Then we switch over, switch channels to the retro channel with Nightmare at Camp Bloodbath from 2023. Which was just a silly one. <laughs> written and directed by <laughs> David Dylan Arnau. Stars Marley Forsyth, Adam Bussell, and Alex Von Klemperer. A little over five minutes. YouTube link. You can watch it right now. What happens? Well, we're told it's Friday the 13th. Halloween night. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> How do they do that? Friday the 13th is not, the 13th is not Halloween. <laughs> Greg and Becky, two camp counselors, return to their cabin to find the place ransacked by counselors from another nearby camp. As they prepare to clean up the mess, they run into Terrence Fisher, the local mass murdering masked psychopath. And things did not go well. <laughs> And it's really a parody of Friday the 13th films, taking many of those films' tropes and just running with them. And it's really comedy. It looks good. It's got a body count, too, so there's the horror elements. It's full 80s retro style. It doesn't go on too long. And it's, it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Friday the 13th movie done for silly. Mm hmm. And finally, Couples Therapy from 2024. Hey, it's a new one. Directed by Tim Hendricks, written by May Cat. Stars Rob Pinkston, Bevan Brew, and John Alton. 12 minutes, 12 seconds. YouTube has it. 12 minutes that are worth it. I like this one too. Rob talks to his prisoner. We see that Rob is a serial killer. The man tied to the chair has no hope until Rob's girlfriend comes home early and looks surprised at the whole situation. Is he going to get loose? Is she going to stop him? No. When Rob slaps a bow and gift card on the man's face, she lights right up. This is a rare serial killer couple. On the downside, their relationship does need some work. It's a good thing Rob captured a couple's counselor. Maybe he can help. And this has some dark humor on it, too. <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, and, and she, you know, they're sitting on, there on the couch, and she's like, you know... It suggested, you know, seeing a couple's counselor. Maybe in his office would have been a better, you know. <laughs> I didn't mean to abduct him. <laughs> As the pair talk about their problems, we get more and more information about their lives and situation. We also wonder if the doctor is going to be able to talk his way out of this. We do, in fact, get all our questions answered. Except for one. Who's going to clean up all that mess? It's a true love story. It is. It's so romantic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is it for this week. We've got more coming for you next week at horrorweekly.com. Sign up now and get the spoilery newsletter with all the details of all these movies. We didn't ruin them for you here, but we'll ruin them for you there. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I'll, we'll see you next week. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. See ya. See ya. See ya.